We'd like to welcome everyone to another edition of the speaker series in the Bingham Gallery. We invite you to join us again on uh, in two weeks for another presentation in which Ashley Finley will be speaking on social change. And the title of her lecture will be, If They Come in the Morning, The Writer's Responsibility in the Face of Injustice. Our presenters today are Jesse Hill, Associate Professor of Psychology, James Taylor, Assistant Professor of Psychology, and Chris Cope, a lecturer on psychology. The title of their lecture is, Did You See That? Humans have been fascinated with vision and their visual world throughout recorded history, as seen in prehistoric cave paintings, petroglyphs, and engravings on caves and cliff sides. Not only has that interest been maintained, it has grown with the advent of artificial intelligence and teaching computer systems how to see the world as humans do. This interactive presentation will explore historical and modern understandings of visual perception in daily life through lecture and demonstrations. Dr. Jessica C. Hill earned a PhD in developmental psychology from Florida State University and an MA in visual cognition and human performance from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research on perceptions of women in leadership within Utah prompted the creation of the USHE, Women's Leadership Exchange, which she co-directs with Dr. Nancy Hawk and Dr. Liz Hitch. She received her first National Science Foundation major research instrumentation grant at Utah Valley University and has received recognition for her research from UVU's Office of Sponsored Programs, an award for research from the Biennial International Seminar on the Teaching of Psychological Science, and the Dean's Award for Faculty Excellence in Research from the College of Humanities and social science. Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor in the behavioral science department at UVU, where he supports student learning in the biopsychology bio, 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 psychology domain. He received his doctorate in experimental psychology from Texas Christian University with an emphasis in behavioral neuroscience. His research interests relate to the intersection of emotion, learning, and memory in human and animals. Dr. Christo uh, Christopher Cope was recently appointed as Assistant Professor of Psychology in the Behavioral Science Department at UVU, where he is currently a lecturer. He received his PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Northern, Univers from Northern Illinois University. He was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Notre Dame and at Arizona State University. His research has focused on learning and intelligent tutoring environments and processes involving learning from multiple and varied, varied text, critical thinking, argumentation, comprehension, and engagement. Dr. Cope's current interests lie at the intersection of his passion for learning, instructing, and mentoring. He currently acts as a mentor for students at UVU on student-generated research projects. We'd like to thank the three professors for coming here and spending their time with us, and we look forward to their, I'm sure, very engaging uh, demonstrations. Well, we're excited to be with, here, with you here today. We've spent quite a lot of time here wandering through the windows ourselves, um, and that's what inspired us to give this talk, is we would meditate on how we're actually seeing the windows as we were viewing the windows. Um, and as sort of this meta moment that we had as we were walking through the windows, we noticed that um, our understanding of vision and how we process it and understand it also changes across time as well. And so we want to share that journey with you. And so we entitled our talk, Did You See That? But it begged the question, are we actually seeing everything in our visual world? And so I have a little demonstration here. We're going to start with it. Um, it is flickering, so if you have epilepsy or might be prone to headaches by flashing stimuli, now might be a great time to avert your eyes. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate for you, but I'm taking a master class with Penn and Teller. This also relates to vision. Um, because I want to teach a class called the Psychology of Magic. And it's all about visual information processing as well. Because when you're thinking about magic, it's sort of this social contract between us. We know it's not real. I'm sorry if you thought it was. I apologize. It's not. Um, but then I have to use what I know about human attention and human vision to direct you to not see what I'm doing. And I think that's a lot of the fun of it, too. The answer to the question that we had, did you see that? The answer is probably not. Just like with magic, you probably aren't seeing what they're doing while um, they're directing your attention elsewhere. And that leads to the idea that Dr. Kopp will talk about later, that we're really constructing the world around us. And so in this moment, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Taylor, and he's going to give us an interesting insight into some of the biological processes of vision. All right. So I think I'm going to hear you today is what is vision? You say, well, it's our sense of light, our ability to see light. And very straightforward, except both of those are really, really compact, interesting ideas, seeing something, and then what it's like. And of course, most of what we're going to be talking about is the seeing portion of this, that's Dr. Kopp and Dr. Taylor are going to talk about a little bit more. 
just wanted to quickly mention, partially because of what we're surrounded with, what we're talking about when we're talking about light. So what we're seeing when we see light is just a small spectrum of a large range of radiation, a specific kind of uh, radiation called electromagnetic radiation. And this energy, we see just a small cross-section of it. But throughout that entire cross-section, we can see nuance. And that nuance we perceive as color differences. So all of these things around us, all of these colors that we see, when we see just the color portions of it, are just segmenting all of these different parts of our visible spectrum. You can see that in terms of a rainbow. When we bend light, we have the different energy for different colors separated with slight different distances. Or we can also think about it with like a flame, for a candle. We have higher energy, so the higher heat, whenever you see a flame, is blue, and it fades out towards red, which is the lower energy. And if we're able to see more of this spectrum, then we would see, in fact, a lot more around this. I think some of this is familiar to us by technology. So if we expand this out, we're looking at light, something larger. I don't know how well these are showing up. This is an example looking up at the night sky. We have telescopes that use look, uh, sampling in what they see based on different parts of this radiation. Here's a visible, visible night sky to us. And then this is looking at that same energy, but different energy uh, levels, different intensities. From lower, like infrared, microwave, and radio waves, which are still part of that same thing, we just see the visible. And then above, where you can be here in X-ray and gamma rays. So, seeing. It's obviously important because this is energy. This energy is something that even very simple single cell organisms, many of them are able to detect light. That way, no, to avoid areas that have higher energy of radiation that might be damaging to their cell. Or when we get more sophistication, knowing where things are dark and to hide, but also trying to approach, depending on if they need the light for gathering food. And as we look at more and more complex organisms, we can see more complex eyes. From when we look at flatworms, we have little photoreceptive pits that can still see light and tell you know, lightness versus darkness and moving around. Compound eyes from insects that are especially good at tracking motion. And eyes from like a goat's eye and squid's eye, which developed very different lines evolutionarily, but similar elements here. The ability to focus in light, gather it, and to do some transforming of that to extract meaningful information. Uh, one cool distinction, the reason I have this little papers, and I mentioned this before, and if you hold those up, if you see those around you, um, and you have the little plus or cross aimed in front of your right eye, and then you cover your left eye and you kind of move that back and forth as you're staring at that cross, you'll notice that the object on the right, it's further away, disappears. So you've got to hold it horizontally. If you hold the paper horizontally with the little cross or X in front of you. There's a spot in our vision about the same visual angle as the full moon that's completely absent from our ability to actually see it. Instead, our brain just fills it in with whatever's there. So if you're one of those that has just the paper and the black dot, you'll notice it's just white. If you're one of those that has the rat inside the bars, you'll notice that the rat seems to have escaped and you just have the bars or anything else. So our brain fills that in for us. An octopus or squid eye, on the other hand, is a little bit more logically designed in the sense that it flips some of the wiring in its eye so that it doesn't have to find spot. So it doesn't have to have that extra level of calculation. So, when we look at light in the eye here, we have light coming in, it gets focused by the cornea and the lens so that we can focus on objects near and far. But this information needs to turn into electrical impulses. Because that's the only language our nervous system speaks. You can shine light on the brain, and unless you've done some genetic tinkering, that doesn't do anything to the brain. So instead, light comes into the eyes, what turns that to an electrical signal. The electrical signal comes back to um, the posterior part of our brain here, called excipital lobe, part of here. And then that information spreads throughout the brain to do more and more complex, sophisticated calculations to figure out what's going on in the visual scene, which includes, like with the blind spot, making things up, fitting narrative and stories. And this is something that we'll talk about here. Dr. Cobb and Dr. Hill will be talking about here in a minute, too. The last point I just wanted to bring up in terms of what seeing means, our conscious vision is all a construct of the brain. It's an important thing here. If you're giving light to someone, that's great, but unless it's going to this system, it's not seen. So next slide has a picture of a snake, and I learned in class yesterday that some people really don't like to see pictures of snakes, so if that bothers you, um, there's a picture of a snake, just wanted to warn you, because I didn't do that in my class yesterday. Uh, this <laughs> example of rattlesnake, many of you have probably seen this hiking or anywhere else. And pit vipers like these have these little openings on their face, that's where they get the name pit from. And they have an eye, obviously, so they have visual information, the light comes back, hits their brain, they see. 
But the pits detect heat, infrared light, that's emitted by objects that aren't producing heat. The interesting thing about pit fibers is this, where it goes in their brain, overlays onto the same area that processes their vision. It's not a separate sense. It's actually processed by their part of their brain processing vision. So that's why when we say that snakes can see in infrared, yeah, they can, because even though it's a different organ that's detecting it, it's still the same part of the brain that's um, interpreting the signal and overlays the images together. So this idea of what are we seeing with this? Is it the eye or is it the brain? What is sight is something that Dr. Hill's going to talk to us about now. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't do a lot of talking. But I will do a little bit of talking, and then you'll do a lot of doing, assuming everything technologically works out. And if not, we'll do what we can do, and it's going to be OK. So this demonstration, um, we're going to test whether things are occurring in the eye or the brain. And so we'll do two activities first as sort of a baseline, so you understand what the activities are and how they're done and what to expect when they happen. And then we'll test them to see whether it's happening in your eye or your brain. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test our color vision and after images. So I'm going to show you an image on the screen, and there'll be a little black dot in the center of the screen, and I'd like you to look at it. Try not to blink, although blink if you have to. Try not to move your eyes, and then I will babble at you for about 40 seconds so it doesn't feel like you're waiting a terribly long time while you're waiting, and then we'll switch the screen and we'll see if you notice anything. So stare at the little black dot, and we're going to stare at this for about 40 seconds. You may recognize sort of the shapes of this item, but it may look a little bit funny uh, with these colors. But that's OK, because in just a second, it's going to get really cool. So don't blink. Well, I guess blink if you want to a little bit. Try not to move your eyes. And what we're going to do is I'm going to count three, two, one, and then I'm going to switch the slide. Just keep your eye in the middle. Here we go. Three, two, one, switch. Oh, what happened there? What did you notice? <laughs> yeah, we saw red, white, and blue flag there. So that's pretty cool. This is an after image. And so meditate on this, because I'm going to ask you in a minute, do you think it's happening in your eye or your brain? So we're going to do a little test with motion, too, because we can process motion. We can tell if things are moving or not. So I'm going to show you a spiral. Just stare at the center of the spiral while it's moving, and we're going to get your little motion-detecting cells really stimulated. And then I'm going to switch to a different picture to see what you notice. Oh, let's see if it's going to work. All right, get your little motion-detecting cells ready. Here we go. Stare at the center. And again, try not to blink. Try not to move your eyes, but let your little motion-detecting cells get stimulated. Ooh, there it goes. So just sort of stare. Get ready. And then I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to say three, two, one, and then I'm going to switch to the other slide. This matters because we're going to do it again. So here we go. Three, two, one. Did it work? It usually works if you're straight on better. Anybody who experienced it, what did you experience? There's <laughs> this kind of weird expanding sort of thing going on. And so then that begs a question. Is that happening? And where is that happening? Is it happening in the eye? Or is it happening in the brain? So we're going to do the same thing again, but we're going to do a little bit different. This takes some coordination. You'll need to use two hands. And so pick an eye. I guess it's the right eye because I've commanded it in the PowerPoint slides. And you just cover it like with a little cup. You don't want to smush your eye because that's not good for your eye. So just like cup over your eye. And then we're going to do the same thing with the flag. We're going to look at it. Except when I count three, two, one, switch, we're going to do this thing. Three, two, one, switch. And we're going to see if something happens. Because if the thing is happening in our eye, then when we switch our eye, we shouldn't have an after image. But if it's happening in our brain and we switch, we should still see an after image. That's the logic of what's going to happen here. So let's give it a try. Let's see if we figure this out. So we're covering our right eye. And if you don't want to, you don't have to, but it's fun. Now stare at the little black dot. And we're going to stare another 40 seconds at the little black dot. It's the longest, well, I guess it's not the longest 40 seconds of your life. That might be going to the dentist if you had to get a root canal or something like that. But it's a pretty long 40 seconds. I wanted to thank you for sharing that 40 seconds of time with me as you stare at a black dot in the center of a computer monitor. I don't know, it feels like 40 seconds. Should we call it? Let's do that. So I'm going to count down. 
I'll say three, two, one, and then I will say switch. And at the same time I'm switching the slide, you're switching eyes. Any questions? Okay, we're gonna do it. Here we go. Three, two, one, switch. Did you get an after image? Let go of that eye. Do you see the after image in the other eye? No, oh, okay. Let's try it with motion. Let's see if we can figure this out. So we're gonna try now again the motion but we're gonna try it with switching eyes. So we're gonna do the same thing. We stare at the spiral. When I switch, we're gonna switch eyes and we're gonna see if we detect anything different. So if I switch and I don't notice anything, then that's probably happening in the eye. But if I switch and I notice something even faintly is going on and we see that same sort of enlargement, then that's probably something happening in my brain. So we will do it again. So just stare at the spiral. That's wonderful with your right eye covered. Yeah, this is good. Now, it works better if you're head on, so we'll see how it goes. We're just gonna stand here and stare at the spiral for a while. Get our little motion detecting cells really excited. They're saying, woohoo, things are spiraling, this is great. And just stare at that middle. It looks like it's moving around a little too, that little middle part. This is not like the most symmetrical spiral that there is. But in just a second, I'm gonna say three, two, one, and then we will do our switching. So get ready for that switching of the hands. Okay, three, two, one, switch. Did you notice anything? A little bit? Yeah, so that's kind of cool. When we switch eyes, and not everybody sees it very strongly, sometimes it's very faint, we're switching to the other side and we notice there's still that visual distortion from it. So we know that that's something that's happening in the brain. We just did neuroscience together. I think that's super awesome. So up until this point, we've been talking really about how visual stimulation, we're taking it in from the outside world and we're doing some basic processes with the eyes. We're doing some basic processes with the brain. Um, and we've had these questions about vision for a long time about how do we process that information. Back in the time of the ancient Greeks, we had Aristotle who wrote a book called De Anima, and he had a whole section on perception and understanding how we perceive the visual world. That proceeded on toward um, the ancient Arabs who did some really incredible work and they investigated the extra mission theory. Some people thought, the reason I see is because light is coming out of my eye. And other people said, whoa, no it doesn't, it's coming in. And so they tested it back in, what was it, like the 1200s. Um, and they were able to figure that out. And it took a little while more before we started understanding how do we apply meaning? What's the cognition behind it? So that first step is understanding that visual information that's coming in. We get the pattern of light falling on our retinas and then we pass it on for further processing. It's similar to if you were laying out um, on a nice afternoon staring up at the clouds. You haven't applied any meaning to it. You haven't applied the word cloud to it. It's just the light falling on your retina. But we know that there are features uh, structures in the brain that process that information and respond to shapes and angles. Some Nobel Prize winning research by Hubert and Weissel did that and they did this with cats and the cats are okay. They were treated relatively well. Um, but what they did was they did single cell recording where they put a little electrode into the brain of the cat and then they would show them shapes on a screen to see where in the brain responded to which shapes. And so what we learned from that is that when cats develop normally and they have both eyes for their whole lives, their brain develops normally and it gets all the right bends and creases in there. But if you raise a cat and you cover one of its eyes so that it can't get stimulation to that part of the brain, its brain doesn't develop normally and it can't process that information later if it doesn't happen while the cat is little. And it gets even worse if you raise a cat with no vision at all. So once it gets to the brain and those shapes are processed, we can now apply meaning to it. And I like to think back to this movie Up. I have small children, and so I watch all sorts of Disney movies. I don't know if you've seen this one. But this is a really sweet movie in which the two main characters, they're in love, they get married, um, and they're sitting out at the park together looking at the clouds, and she starts seeing babies in the clouds. Now the clouds aren't really turning into babies. That's not what happens at all. She's applying meaning, and she's applying a shape to it as she thinks about it. So we do this all the time. Our expectations and our knowledge can guide our perception. For example, what's in this picture? 
oh, you know all the answers. Excellent. It's a Dalmatian, so we can put a little line around it. Uh, the patterns of light and dark are... <laughs> it, was, it was a Dalmatian. We just had to process. Um, and so we have to, to process those patterns of light and dark that come on our eyes. And even without the shape of the dog there, we may have been able to see, oh, there's a Dalmatian there, because we know there's only one kind of medium-sized mammalian critter that we walk around with that may have black and white spots. I have another example. So if you didn't see the Dalmatian, uh, we can practice again. This one's a little harder. Don't say what it is. Here's one for you. Take a moment to process. This one's way harder. Did you figure it out? OK, good. One person has seen it. Oh, three people have seen it. Do you want a hint? OK. Moo. <laughs> I'll give a bigger hint, if you'd like. It's a cow. <laughs> Some people can't see the cow, and I've learned how to model the cow in my classes because they're like, I don't see a cow. And that's OK. The cow is sort of looking at you like this. OK? This is the ear. Here's another ear. Here's the head, and there's an eye, and there's an eye, and then it comes, ooh, I touched it, down to the nose. Right? And so this is a great example because we're all seeing the same visual stimuli falling on a retina, but it takes us a little while to apply that meaning. So that gap, and maybe if, if you had to wait till you heard moo or it's a cow, and then you were able to see it, that shows your expectations um, being applied to the stimuli and shaping your perception. It was something you hadn't seen before, and then all of a sudden you can see it. And now if you can see the cow, you can never unsee it again. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kopp at this point. Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> I think this was set up nicely by Dr. Taylor and Dr. Hill. What we do when we look at masterpieces like this is we try to interpret what's actually going on. And this is a fantastic example of pieces in history that lead up to the current times. We just go all the way to the, look to the right side of the room. You think about the wall in terms of the beginning. Now, when I first came to the university here, the first day that I was here, I actually interviewed for the position that I have. And uh, if you don't know this, what happens is the protocol is you go through and you meet a bunch of people and you have these discussions and then you say, we're going to go down and we're going to go look at the uh, stained glass piece down in the library. Well, that was weird. <laughs> and then I got down here and I was like, this is amazing. My interpretation of this was I've spent time down here sitting and just staring. It's one of those places where you can really just come and kind of get inside your own head and just look at each frame, at each cell. And each one of these tells a different story. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to talk to you about some art that I saw when I was a kid. When I was up from Illinois, and they grew up around, uh, around the Chicago area. And we went down to the uh, Art Institute in Chicago, and this piece by George Sra is in the Art Institute in Chicago. And if you're not familiar with it, it's called the Sunday on the Jate. It's painted in 1884. How many people have seen this? Before? How many people have seen this in person? It's a fantastic piece. Right? And if you actually go to the art museum, this is what you you can get this close to. It. There's just a little chain that divides you from the actual painting. And I love pieces like this because I would, this one always stuck out to me. Something that was really kind of special and kind of cool. And if you go and you look back at where this actually is, um, this is the actual place in France where it was painted. This was the, the position that he was standing when he was thinking of painting this. Let's go back. Can somebody tell me, just looking at this, or this, either one, <laughs> tell me a little story. What, what can you make of this? What do you interpret? It's a Sunday afternoon. It's a Sunday afternoon. What do people do? Watching the ships. Okay, watching things on the, on the river, right? Can you tell me a little bit about the people that are that are being depicted in the picture? Yeah. They're a little bit more upper class. They're a little bit more upper class. How do you know? This is 1800 francs. I don't want to spoil too much. Okay. Well, years ago, so. Okay. All right. Anybody else? What gives it away to the upper class? Why? The winter dress. Winter dress. And if you look close, there's some weird things in here. Oh, 
Come across here, monkey. All right. Uh, this is the soldiers. There's people in the rowboats. This is a rowing team. Okay. Yeah. So those, the, the two gentlemen at, at the front, they are dressed differently. They are. This one here and this one here. Right? And if we're making assumptions about relationships between proximity, that's an interesting assumption that they should make. Now, <laughs> just going along with that, their whole pose. That yeah. guy's a lot more relaxed. Yeah, he's slow formal. Yeah, there's all kinds of little minutiae in here. There's all kinds of little details that you can pull apart and you can make these stories. There's a lot of different perspectives that people can use to try to make this story, right? Now, this movie. <laughs> is remember Ferris Bueller? Okay. Now, I'm going to start here just because Ferris is hanging out with his girlfriend and in front of a stained glass window. That's kind of cool. Right? So Cameron, character, he's having a moment with this picture in the art museum. And what's, fa what's fascinating about this is that this depiction in this film is actually extracting something that's really cool about the painting. What do we know about the painting? See What's on the point of this? Okay, so it's just, it's not brush strokes. It's millions and millions of little dots. Right? And this little girl, she's in the center of the picture. And she is looking right at him. And he's having this amazing moment with this girl. The, the, how intricate that had to have been to paint this huge picture with these millions of little dots. Okay, so taking a step back, we have this awesome picture, right? And what people take for granted is it's actually a sequel. Right? So the Sarah actually painted this picture. This picture is uh, this picture was painted two years before. This is in Chicago. This one's actually hanging in an art museum. Has anybody ever seen this one? Mm -mm. Yeah? Okay. If you look closely, it's actually two different sides of the same river. Okay. Now, it's hard to say if it's actually at the same moment, but what kind of observations do you guys glean from this? What can you tell me? Seems like a different class of people on this side than on the side. It's, that's exactly true, right? And I think that's intentional. And so what gives that away? Basically, the way that they're dressed, right? And what are these guys doing? Somebody's in the, in the river, right? And they just look like, like this guy might be on the wrong side of the river, right? And this guy is yelling something to the people across the way. And there's all this. This is very interesting because you can think about it in terms of going through just like what you would do here. Right? If you look at every frame, there's cells, and you can go from top to bottom, and each one tells a little story. Right? Basically, what this is doing are two different pieces of art. Now, we call this inference generation. We're making these inferences based on these two different, we're going to call them cells. If you look at this cell right here, you can put these two stories, it's a simple story, you can put them together. And this is not new, we've done this our, all of our lives. Right? Um, and the way we do this involves prior knowledge. So prior knowledge is guiding how we interpret this. And the inferences and the assumptions that we're going to make. We learn this from an early age. This, these are materials that I've used in my own research from a children's book called A Boy, Dog, and Flop. Does anybody remember reading Mercer Mayer stories when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. This one's unique because it has absolutely no language in it at all. They're just picture stories. And what we did is we went through and we identified different, we call them goal episodes. We learn at an early age that there's structure to stories. Now, uh, I learned it when I have a little girl, she's 10 years old. When she was young, I used to read her books. Still read to her sometimes. 
But she got to the point where she could read to me. She could tell me the stories. She wasn't reading. But she had memorized the stories based on the pictures. Okay? And this is kind of what we do. So here we have the beginning of the goal episode. There's the main character, there's a little boy. He's tall, he sees the frog. He's running towards the frog. At some point, but falls head first into the river. Right? So we call this the beginning, the middle, and the end states of this episode. He failed. Right? And then afterwards, we see the little frogs like, whoa, what just happened? Mm -hmm. right? A little surprised. What kind of assumption can you make based on these three cells? How did he end up in the river? Or in the lake, or in the pond? Tripped on the branch there. Tripped on the branch. Right? So the point is, it doesn't tell you explicitly that this, that's what happened. Right? But you're, you're making that inference that this happened. Now, how many people in here read comic books? Or have read a comic book? Right? Marvel Studios is making millions of dollars now off of everything that they've published for the past 60-something years. Right? <clears throat> comic books are interesting because they also, not only do they have the cell structure where there's these pieces of information that you necessarily have to make inferences to understand, but they also include words. This is from a comic that's printed in the mid-30s called Phantom Man. Phantom Man was kind of like a precursor to Superman. He had most of the same powers. This is uh, part of a comic where Jane was a circus high diver. She jumped into a lake. She was drowning. Phantom Man comes out of nowhere, saves her. Well, here we go. And comes to the surface of the tiny lake near the amusement park. So he's got her wrapped around his neck and he's going up through the water. Then he goes to, you have to go the rest of the way yourself, and things that require great haste. And she says, but wait, but there's things that happened in between. It's not hard for us to understand and process this information. But we don't see him coming out of the water with her. We don't see him putting her down on the deck of wherever they are. We don't see her removing her swim cap. But we make these inferences that they occur. <clears throat> so our understanding of the world really depends on context, and the context is largely driven by our understanding of the world. It's weird how to say how we say that. But it's our prior knowledge. Right? Our ability to process incoming information necessarily requires us to activate information to be able to, to comprehend things. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what comes to mind when you read the following sentence. Mary had a little lamb. How about this one? Mary had a little lamb. She's still very mid dry on her dress. <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> some of you look a little confused. Okay, Mary had a little lamb means Mary ate some lamb. <laughs> In the context of it's fleece of lamb, everybody's like, well, that's just meat. It's not really meat. How many people in here like lamb? It's delicious, right? Served with mint jelly, questionable, but people do it, right? How about this one? Mary had a little lamb. The delivery was a difficult one, and afterwards, the vet needed a drink. <laughs> Still makes sense. Still makes sense, right? But it's the context. Because you already set yourself up for this, these two, right? You understand this one. This one's more challenging. All right, how about this? You plunked down $10 at the window. She tried to give him five dollars, but he refused to take it. Where are we going? What is this? Does somebody tell me what this looks like? It's a little sure ambiguous. It what it looks like for me, or what it looks like? Well, what do you think is going on? Betting on the horse. Betting on the horse. Okay, that's a good one. And a driver. And a driver. He pumped out by ten dollars. He goes to try to give five dollars, but he refused to take it. Okay. Anything else? Any other ideas? On a date. On a date. Where at? Somewhere where there's a window. Movie. So when we got inside, she bought a, lad, a large bag of popcorn. Right? Now, you, make these, you have to make these connections, right? 
just by itself. These two sentences, it's challenging when you're guessing, right? But then when you get all three of them, it makes sense. But you don't see the part where he pulled the $10 bill out of his wallet, he put it on the thing, and she took it, gave him change, she tried to, there's a date, he tried to pay for her own way, he refused, there's not, that's not in there, right? We put all this together. Now, film trailers are fun. And, and again, this just kind of speaks to our ability to understand what's going on when you go see a movie. What, why do they call them trailers, first of all? Do you guys know why? Because they used to be at the end of the film. Right? Now, if the movie starts at 1 o'clock, it probably isn't even going to start for another half an hour. You have time to go to the bank, get out alone, then you can go <laughs> pay for the film, get some refreshments. Right? <clears throat> film trailers are good and bad. To me, they feel like if I watch the trailer, it's telling me what the whole movie's about, it ruins the film. Because you have already seen two minutes of everything. Right? Yeah, the best one. Is it going to happen? I think so. That's right. You've all seen Mary Poppins, most of us, right? Mary Poppins is a Disney film. It's a magic nanny comes flying in. seconds of, of nonsense. It really is. And that's not what the film is about. Um, there are a lot of things out there. When we're talking about perception, vision, and what we're understanding, we can go through and we can look. Every time I look at this, I see something new or something different. I'm making new connections every time. It's just like watching a film. Every time you watch a film that you've already seen it a dozen times, you see something new. I always go to The Godfather. It's always the one I see. You guys like the movie The Godfather? Every time you see the movie The Godfather, there's always something new. You watch that movie. Danny Simon's a researcher from the University of Illinois. Uh, he has done research on um, inattentional and intentional blindness. Now, I'm going to play this video for you, and I want you to follow him. He has instructions on here. Just do what he says, and then I want to talk to you guys. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Okay. How many did you guys count? How many got 16? 15? You guys are in the ballpark? How many guys did not count at all? All right. <laughs> How many people saw the gorilla? How many people did not see the gorilla? How many people are afraid to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should be once, but I didn't. Saw the gorilla. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. 
If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leading the game? So what happens is that uh, this is a very, it's a well-known user study. A lot of people have seen this before. And it's based in the very first instance that it came out. But then it was replicated. And they added these two other variables in there. One of the people leaves. And you focus, if you know this, you're focused on the gorilla. And you're like, oh yeah, you saw the gorilla. You didn't catch me this time. But did you notice that somebody left and that the actual curtain changed color? Yes. Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the yeah, So this speaks to the, uh, the idea that we don't attend to everything. We can't. Right? We go through and we process information, we see things in our visual field, but there's a lot of things that slip through. Right? We can walk around this campus all day long. We can see people, we can see things. You're not going to remember them. I'm not going to remember all of you. Hopefully you remember me. <laughs> but for the most part, everything that comes into our visual system doesn't get processed. We miss a lot. The interesting, fascinating thing about this is that you had a goal to count how many times as people were passing the ball. That's what you're focused on. Why would you pay attention to whether or not a gorilla actually came in? And it's even less likely that you would notice that one person ducked out and the, the color of the curtain changed. You're not focused on that. And the color of the curtain is very gradual. So we don't, we don't process this that deeply. Yeah. I screwed up. Because when I was doing it, I was counting. And then all of a sudden I realized some aren't passing it, some are bouncing it. That's true. So I, that is true. But that's not bounce pass, right? Well, that's a bounce pass. It's true. It's a good catch. Yeah. All right. Oh, nice. It does work. So, uh, did you have something? It's me. Oh, OK. Uh, so Dr. Hill, as soon as we take this over, talk about a little bit more about the technological abuse. So I think what's really interesting to this point is we've learned that we process a lot of information coming in, but we don't attend to it all and we don't retain it all. Um, and we can miss a lot of things that happen in our environment. And so I think that the future of uh, visual processing is going to be very interesting because we can leverage artificial intelligence and computers to assist us in tasks where it's very important that maybe we don't miss something. So for example, there's a really cool project going on at Stanford right now where they've made a Jack Rabbot. I want to say rabbit every time. Um, and this is a really interesting robot who has to learn to navigate the visual environment. Uh, its job is to go from place to place, perhaps deliver things. What's really interesting is they programmed the robot to be socially aware. So there's at one point in the video where a person comes up and holds out their arms to give the robot a hug and the robot goes so that it can be hugged. Um, so that's one interesting way that artificial intelligence has to process the visual world. Another one that maybe we've heard more controversies about in the news lately, self-driving cars and trucks. Uh, we have Google who's trying to have self-driving cars, the accidents with Tesla. There are several different truck companies. Um, Actually, what is that one? I think I-10, down south, actually ha are having exit-to-exit -exit completely autonomous uh, semi-trucks that are driving overnights now. 
So I mean, this is happening, but those machines have to be taught to process the visual world as well, which can be quite complicated, as we've noticed from the accidents that occur. And one way that scientists have been teaching artificial intelligence is how to process the visual world is to teach it like children. When we're little, I don't know if you remember, um, you'd look around the world and maybe there was a rabbit over there and you'd say, kitty, and your parent would say, no, that's a rabbit. Um, and you'd learn over time by repeated exposures to things that, oh, well, this is a cat and this is a dog, this is a rabbit. So they started trying to teach computer systems to do this too, to teach it in the same way as a child through a repeated exposure. And over time, the computers have gotten really good. You can teach them with re repeated exposures to cats or to cancer. Right now, there's a big push into cancer diagnosis and letting artificial intelligence diagnose the cancer for us because their rate of identifying it is right now equal to humans, and we're hoping to get it better than humans too. Which leads us to some thoughts that Dr. Taylor has um, about other really cool biological things. Yeah, the, the idea here, is, uh, Dr. Hill is talking about, is you know, we can use the way humans learn to inform how we can have machines do things, and the other way around works too. If we want to be able to use our visual system, we can, uh, and maybe there's a problem with that, we can harness our technology for that. As I said, when I was talking about snakes, for example, it's not about the stimulus, when you're talking about something like vision or any of your senses, it's about where it's being processed that matters. And the brain only speaks electrical signals. So, you may be familiar with cochlear implants for people who are, have hearing impairments or are deaf. Uh, no, it's a controversial issue on um, whether or not to use those. But the technology about that is, well, if the ear doesn't work, but the brain is intact, we can use a microphone to analyze those signals and then just put those signals into the brain on that same pathway. And those have been around for quite a while now, getting more and more sophisticated. And there are developments for visual prosthesis as well, where you have cameras, but you're associated with glasses, or they also have some now that are trying to implant directly onto the retina. Basically, picking one of the parts on our stream of processing visual information to just do that same stimulation. Having electrical stimulation either in the back of the eye, along the pathway that goes to our visual processing, or right onto the part of the brain that does visual processing. Only one of, there's only one device really that's approved by the FDA for use of visual prosthesis right now, but there are plenty in development. Very active area of research, as you might imagine. And even though it works, I mean, the vision, uh, visual acuity is, I read this recently, something like 21,000 vision, so still very, very poor vision, but object recognition is possible. There's other ways that people do this too. Has anyone heard of BrainPort before? Anything else? BrainPort's a really cool device that's similar idea here is you have a camera and the glasses, uh, your phone in this case, or other device can um, analyze the signal, and then sends that to this little pad. The pad's like one of those, um, Pin arts you might have played with as a kid, it has little bumps. But uh, you put that in your mouth and it sits on your tongue. And it gives patterns of stimulation that match with the visual stimulation that's coming into the camera. And with use, people are able to actually identify objects in the visual environment. Again, they don't see them though, because it's not stimulating the pathway for vision, but they are able to recognize objects based on that stimulation pattern. You may have also heard um, David Eagleman's presentation, he's had 10 talks about this recently too in the last few years. Um, is a vest currently that's being used as a prosthesis to help with um, people who are deaf, but there's many other applications they're looking for. Essentially, it's a vest with little vibration motors. The initial versions were just the vibration motors from cell phones. <coughs> they have a microphone, and then it goes to a cell phone. It's recording that input in the environment, and then just sends that to the motors. And the array is able to create a representation of the sound that our nervous system learns with training to identify with acoustic signals so that you can start recognizing words based on the patterns of stimulation across your body. They're now looking at this for helping with predicting stocks and looking at the weather and other things too because the human brain is a pattern-making machine. We, are, we have sophistication and ability to build and extract patterns that we can't replicate with um, computers right now. So harnessing what we already have and just using that, we're hoping to do that with vision as well. So that was, only, that was my little lead-in back to here. And Chris, Chris are you closing this out here? Yep. Awesome. So I want to say thank you guys for coming. It was very nice to have you all. Uh, but I kind of want to close this. I want to invite you guys to this frame. This frame is celebrating. And here we have a depiction of Van Gogh's Starry Night. It's fascinating. It's amazing. But in that frame, there's a lot of things going on. 
Samuel Clemens, right? And a lot of pointing guys to the guy in the very center. Who's that? What's going on with him? Does anybody know? Tom Edison, what's he doing? He's inventing the light bulb. How is he interacting with any of those pictures? He's pulling a star out. Right? That's amazing. And if you think about the history of the windows, the history of the stained glass up until this point, up until right now, there's no light. There's no artificial light. And then we have just a little bit afterwards. It's probably one of the most important pieces because we need, we need that. Right? We didn't have it. We didn't have electricity. So I'd like to focus on that, and I'd like to invite you guys to go ahead and look around. We were going to talk about some Easter eggs, but you guys know what Easter eggs are? There's little hidden things in here. I'm not going to ruin it for you. There's a few. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you. We've given you guys a talk on our sensation of vision, how we perceive the world around us, different ways that we can understand the world, the different things that go into our perception. If you guys have any questions, now's the time to ask. Yes. How many different faces are there in all these images? That is good. <laughs> How many different faces? I have the wrong guy to ask that question. Does anybody in here know? Who would know that question? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There, I'm sure that somebody has a number, but I'm pretty sure that every face has been put here for a reason. They're all different. They're all different, as far as I know. That's true. Well, and a lot of them are actually artists that worked on this. That's, well, some, they, not, not a lot. Not a lot. Some there, are, there are the artists that actually have worked on this and have put themselves in, into the mural. Any other questions? Field? I'd like to point out that your Ciroc painting actually does appear in this window right now. Oh. Oh. On the far right, it's small. Those what? two figures behind the gun yeah. painting. On the far right. My right? Yes. Yeah. Just right there. I'm still not seeing. You're pointing right at it. Oh, my God. 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 It's amazing. I didn't even know that. He picked this picture. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It was, yeah, it was See, awesome. it's totally subliminal. Yeah. When the students walk by this mural on the outside, what do they see? Do they see this mural? Um, I don't think so. Okay, I think there's a protection, there's a protective layer. I mean, you can see, but yeah. the light's not going out. Well, if you walk by it on the inside, so what you'll see on the outside is mostly white glass. And because it's outdoors, the light's coming from outside, so it's just going to be dark. Yeah. At nighttime, it would reverse, and so the light would be coming from inside, and so the outside would be...